Greetings, ladies and metal gents, and welcome to this latest narration of the web series The Survivor Becomes a Dungeon. If you are new to the series, there is a playlist listed down below in the description. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Chapter 99 Isak Point of View Hungry. He's so hungry. How long has it been? He's not even sure he's actually awake yet, or if it's just some kind of dream. He tries to open his eyes, yet he's only created by more darkness. Is he blind? What? What's going on? His limbs feel so heavy, and he's having trouble breathing. Wait, no. His nose is just blocked up for some reason. He can breathe just fine through his mouth. Taking a deep breath, he quickly realizes how thirsty he is as well. His mouth unbearably dry for some reason. Trying to move around, he's suddenly aware of some faint breathing nearby. A heartbeat. The turning of a page in a book, and a distinct scent of a candle burning nearby, despite his nose being blocked up. Hey, you! You're finally awake, said a voice that sounded as if it were whispered. Yet to him, it was almost as if she was speaking in his ear. It took him a moment, but Isak soon realized it was Jody. He felt her footfalls as they distinctly thudded against the stone floor. And before long, she was right beside him. You need to try and stay relaxed. Your senses are hyperactive right now, and it's going to take some time and practice before you're able to handle day-to-day -day stimulus, she explained, in what sounded like a voice barely louder than a breath. Yet, it reached his ears clearly and distinctly, as if she were talking normally. Uh, what? He started to say in a normal voice before clutching his ears and crying out in pain. His own voice sounded like thunder, and his own sound of pain crashed into his senses as he shuddered and panted, writhing on the floor before a powerful hand clamped down in his mouth, shutting him up. His ears were still ringing, and now he couldn't breathe at all. C keep your mouth shut. Don't even say a word. I haven't even removed your earplugs yet, and I'm barely whispering. Your own voice is going to break you as you are now, she warned with a harsh whisper before pulling away once he managed to collect himself taking a slow, deep breath once he was able to. He heard Jolie shifting around, water sloshing around in a water skin, and a cork being pulled. Open up, let's get the thirst slate, and then we'll see about getting you some food. With that, he opened his mouth wide, and in moments water started trickling down. Even the noise of the water filling his mouth was uncomfortable as he eagerly drank, panting as softly as he could manage, while being all too aware of the sound of his own lungs and heartbeat. Once the water stopped, he could hear Jody stepping away and moving around. I'm going to get you something to eat, work on sitting upright and stretching. I want you mobile enough to feed yourself, she said, before walking further away. The sound of her steps heading away before ascending some kind of staircase. Straining his ears, he could hear and almost feel her footsteps somewhere above him before they headed further away. Isak took another slow breath, trying his hardest to not even breathe too hard as he soundlessly worked on pushing himself up off the ground. His muscles were unbearably stiff, but he pushed through it and got himself into a seated position. He feels bigger. His clothes don't fit quite right anymore, and his body just feels different than he remembered. Before he could lose himself in his own thoughts, he figured out he ought to do as Joni ordered and got to stretching rolling his shoulders and twisting around as he popped his back. The disgustingly brutal sound of cracks and pops he heard coming from himself nearly deafened him, and he was briefly worried that he broke something. Before the resounding relief he felt moments after he popped his back, he couldn't find any noticeable damage to his body. Isak must have lost track of time at some point, feeling the sound of Jody's steps above him, returning in what felt like only seconds since she left. The smell of food reaching his nose in the next few seconds despite being plugged up, causing his stomach to let out a thundering rumble as he was reminded of the sensation of hunger that woke him up in the first place. All right, Isaac, eat up, she said simply, raising a bowl in his hands before taking a step back. And no, there aren't any utensils, just drink and chew, she ordered, before making her way back to where he heard her sitting earlier. Unsure of what was in the bowl, he brought it up to his nose, trying to get a sense of what it was while slowly shaking the bowl to listen to it. Whatever it was, it sloshed around like some kind of chunky sludge. He could smell a faint hint of cooked meat, smoked, and a vaguely savory scent of boiled grains mixed with animal fat. It took everything to stop himself from outright asking what was in the bowl as he brought it to his lips and took a drink. Almost immediately, he gagged at the sensation of the thick slurry flowing into his mouth 
but managed to keep from puking on himself as he swallowed it down and felt it trail down his throat. Jody snickered softly at his expense as she watched him eat. Sucks, I know. Don't worry. You'll only have to put up with it for a couple days. Then we can see about reintroducing normal foods to you, she whispered before collecting her book. The fluttering sound of flipping pages filling his ears until she found the page that she was at before. With that, Issa just sighed silently and continued to quietly drink down the slurry of shredded meat and boiled grains. But Maury, point of view. The morning came and went as I watched over the hungover birds and squirrels. It was a miserable sight, to be sure. After making sure they all got a good drink of water, they began to disperse to get on with their day, as Dianiva and Jack led their respective groups into the day's tasks. Left to my own devices, I decided to head for my mountain and check in with the sinners and Basti. It isn't long before I'm in the training room following the trail of self-sustaining magic lights to maintain the training area. Once there, I spot both Uru and Basti with the sinners and Frisbee standing around them in a wide circle. The two of them are, well, they're juggling rocks for some reason. Basti seems to be having fun with it, while Uru is desperately focusing on the task at hand. The sinners, for their part, seem to be having fun as they enjoyed the show, while occasionally passing over another round stone or for Uru and Basti to juggle, altogether appearing more animated and lively like normal people, instead of the imitation of people they used to be. Looking around, I spot Dredd standing off to the side, observing the whole affair quietly, and with a rather stern expression on his face. Oh, what's going on? I ask as I approach. Despite not really trying to disguise my presence, I could sense I startled him as his ears perked at my words. Though he plays it impressively, relaxed as he looked over at me and lowered his head in respect. Creator, you honor me with your presence. With that, he raised his head and turned to look at the others. The executioner and tactician are currently undergoing the final test as imposed by the others. If they can both reach ten stones, then they'll be deemed sufficiently coordinated enough to pass as people. He explained before looking back at me, feeling satisfied with the summary he presented. Huh. Well, that's certainly an interesting metric to go by. Most people would be hard-pressed to juggle two things, let alone ten. But if that's the bar that was set, then more power to them. I glanced over at Dredd, and I could tell that he was, uh, not exactly happy, but content to be around me, though he quickly averted his gaze once he caught himself staring at me. Is everything all right? You also don't have to keep calling me creator. I didn't make you. You existed, and you exist again. Sure, you're not exactly the same as you were previously, but I can't take credit for making you. He maintained the stoic expression, but his ears betrayed him as they drooped at my words. Looking back over at me, I could tell that he was really considering his words before speaking up. The man who I was before all of this is dead and gone. I am no longer the person who was raised up and shaped to be a weapon of the apostates who wear a mask of the church. My soul has been remained by your touch, my body irreversibly redesigned by your will, and my perspective on life itself made new by you. He reached out, gently touching my shoulder and holding my gaze. To me, you are my creator. Your actions and will have made it so. I'm more than a little disturbed by his words. If I didn't know better, this would look like he was professing his love for me. But love is not the right word for this. It's devotion. The way he speaks about what I have done to him, the reverence in his words and gaze, it only confirms to me that what I have done, as and can do, have already placed me beyond the definition of humanity, and it scares me. I did it all so casually, too, with barely any thought and primarily on whims. I do my best to squash these feelings away and just offer Dread a small smile. If you feel so strongly about it, then, I suppose I won't stop you from addressing me as you wish. He doesn't sense my concern or just how much he disturbed me. His ears perking up as he pulled away and offered a rare smile. Thank you, creator. He stated respectfully, bowing his head before turning to look at the others once more. After this, they plan on heading out to the theocracy, and the executioner will be taking Diarosa back to the hegemony to begin your plans of sowing discord between the two factions. So soon? I didn't realize. Taking another look at the group, Basti finally spots me, flashing a toothy grin before focusing back on the task at hand. I looked back at Dredd and quirked my brow at him. And what about you? What are you up to? Dredd stood a little straighter before speaking. Since I am unable to convincingly return to my posting within the church, 
I intend on tracking down the Imperial spies that are set up within the theocracy, and aiding them by offering all the information I can about the activities the apostates are involved with. Everything from dirty guards, lending groups, city officials, church officials, compromised orphanages, everything. He stated resolutely, the fur on his cheeks and ears starting to bristle with anger as he reflected on all the things he knew of. However, I am not leaving with the others. I must wait for your blacksmiths to finish preparing my new equipment. I see. And what was wrong with your old sword and shield? They were quality pieces, after all, though perhaps a little dirty when I returned them to him. Dread paused for a bit, gathering his words before glancing over at me. Would you like to hear the practical reason or the personal reason? I took a moment to consider his question before bobbing my head a bit. Let's go with the practical first. But that, Dread nodded. The sword and shield were obviously those of holy knights of the church. As I am a beastkin now, having those would only draw unwanted attention from all the wrong sorts. Ah, of course. I didn't consider that. I have to admit, that particular detail slipped my mind. Now, what is the personal reason? Red hesitated, looking away and looking at the others as they clapped for Basti and Uruuru, the duo getting close to reaching ten stones each. Those weapons were stained with the innocent blood, and I couldn't continue to wield them in a good conscience. You may think of me as a coward for it, but I'd rather they be destroyed, to never be used again to harm anyone or anything. He's really thought about this, hasn't he? I reach out and gently pat his back. I don't think you're a coward. Your thoughts and feelings are valid. And if you find comfort in casting away the sword and shield, then nobody can judge you for it. Just remember what you're fighting for. Or rather, you should figure that out for yourself. I say as I offer a small smile. As your creator, I should let you grow and find your own path. So, think on it. For what purpose do you raise your blade? For what or who do you fight for? I could sense my words having an impact on Dread as he regarded me once more before nodding to himself. I thank you for your guidance. I shall probably reflect on this later. Suddenly, the cheers were much louder as both Basti and Uruu had managed to catch and maintain their juggling with the tenth stone. They then steadily start dropping the stones as they finish their display. Looking back over it, Dread, I flash a small smile and gesture for him to follow. If you need it, we can talk later. For now, there's something we've got to discuss with everyone. With that, I approach the others and clap my hands together. All right, everyone. May I gather around? I've got something for you all before you go. End of chapter. I'd quickly like to thank the T5 peeps, Vidmori, Terran on Air, Cold War Boomer Boffin, Severin Cerberus, Red Panda 121, Leslie 517, Bushmaster 177, Casper Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Lightshock, Dragzoon WRE, Lord Azrakul, and Arcadian. Thank you.